I founded Mars One two years ago. Uh, Mars One is going to put uh, humans on the planet Mars in the year 2023. And every two years after that, we'll land four more people on the red planet. And you see here what that might look like. <laughs> now you might ask, why would people want to go to Mars? I think Gerard has already answered some of those questions. Uh, so the, the most important reason is that there's, there's, there's science, uh, there's things to research there. there. There might be life on Mars. Imagine what it would mean if we find life on Mars, which is uh, not related to life on Earth. Then there's life on two planets in our solar system. It must mean that there's life everywhere in the universe if we can find it on Mars. There's uh, places on Mars that are much older than the oldest places on Earth. So you can learn more about the history of the solar system. But the most important reason to go to Mars, as Gerard also already said, is curiosity, to inspire. And imagine what happened uh, when humans walked on the moon, the whole world watched in awe, and especially in the US, because this was a US project, everybody thought <coughs> that anything was possible, and when you think that anything is possible, a lot of things are suddenly possible. So this is what, uh, what the next step, the next giant leap can bring us, can bring us something to look forward to and something that can inspire us to think that anything is possible. So I myself was inspired uh, to work on this already 15 years ago when the first rover landed on Mars. It's the, the little tiny one over here. It's a Sojourner rover. And when I saw that, for some reason, I thought, I want to go to Mars. I cannot explain it. Uh, I, I was still studying uh, in Trent University back then. And I started researching uh, what do you need to go to Mars, uh, does it already exist, how much would it cost? But of course, I had, besides working on a mission to Mars, I also had to study. So I, at some point, I didn't work on that for some time. I worked on it again in 2006, until about uh, two years ago, I met uh, Paul Romer, the inventor of uh, Big Brother, uh, with a very vague idea that we had to finance a mission to Mars with the, uh, the public interest, and that's uh, when we, uh, my co-founder and I, started uh, Mars One. So, a human mission to Mars, is it possible with current technology? Well, we have rockets that are big enough to send the equipment we need and the humans to Mars. We know how to land things on Mars. Uh, NASA has tried it now eight times, uh, of which seven times were successful, that, so that's pretty well, uh, pretty well understood. <laughs> Uh, we, we have the technology to keep humans alive in space, uh, and the same technology can be used to keep humans alive on Mars. And we have uh, robotic systems to uh, prepare a settlement before the humans actually go there. Now there's uh, one very important thing that we don't have, and that's the return mission. <laughs> but, you, all, you all guys all laugh. I would like to see, is anyone, would anyone consider, if it was a, a, a well-designed mission to Mars, would anyone consider going there on a one-way mission? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we really might you, actually. Wow. Can you guarantee so, that they're not going to go crazy and that, kill me? That's the, that's the <laughs> questions in the end. So, Only if there's a bar. Build your own brewery, <laughs> It's a, it's a little bit controversial, but don't forget that throughout history, people have, uh, have, have gone to places on one-way trips. People, even in the 50s, people left Europe buying a one-way ticket on the boat. Of course, they could go back, but very many of them did not. And uh, if there are people that want to go on a one-way mission, then why would you bother with a return mission? If it's so complex, it will take us 50 years or more, in my opinion, before we can send humans to Mars and back. And there's so many people who want to do this. <laughs> there's so many people who want to do this. Just, just a few, uh, two weeks ago we announced that uh, what, the, what the requirements for the people are that we will be looking for. And in one week, 33,000 people filled in an email form saying that they are interested to be kept up to date about this process. And we've, uh, we're receiving thousands of emails from people who say, I want to go. So the, the interest is there. <coughs> so two years ago, I started uh, Mars One. Mars One is now a not-for-profit organization because of the interest that we've seen from uh, the audience. So 
people from everywhere are saying, can we help you? Can we please donate? Uh, and there's really a lot of interest in the world in, uh, in something as exciting as this. And I think that's uh, in part because of uh, all the news that we get nowadays is, is very negative. It's about economic crisis, it's about terrorist attacks, it's about uh, wars. And people really need, want something, something inspiring, something positive to talk about. I was interviewed by Al Jazeera uh, about a week ago. And the reporter actually said to me afterwards, oh, we really hope that you will be successful because we need this. We need this kind of news. So how will it, how will it work? In 2016, we want to send the first demonstration mission to Mars that shows uh, that the technology that we need uh, works. In 2018, we will send a rover to Mars that's going to drive around on the surface looking for the best location uh, for the settlement. Can you start the movie, Felix? Then in 2020, we'll, land, uh, we'll send six missions to Mars, six missions to Mars, uh, a supply unit, uh, a second rover as a spare, uh, two uh, life support units, and two living units. And all these, uh, yeah, the one that's, uh, uh, no, the, the, the right one, yeah, that one. Uh, and all these missions will land in exactly the same technology. So the mission that lands in 2016, the rover in 2018, and all the components that are going to show up uh, now, they all land in the same technology to, to uh, build a track record for the technology in which the humans will land, because they will land also in the same technology as, uh, as all the hardware. So the rovers will move all the components to the location of the settlement. They will deploy the solar panels. Uh, they will... Uh, put the living units in place and they will inflate the, in, in, uh, the inflatable uh, habitats where the humans will live. And uh, finally, if all this is operational and when it's been proven that we have uh, water in the storage tanks, oxygen in the storage tanks and there's a breathable atmosphere, then we will send the humans in the year 2022. They will land in the year 2023. On Mars, they will first do a lot of construction because they will find a, 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 an outpost that's habitable but it's not finished yet. They'll have to finish it, they'll have to uh, deploy the solar panels, and then they can, can start actually exploring a whole new planet with a land area that's almost as big as the land area of Earth, because Mars is smaller, but it has no oceans. Oh, can you go back to the presentation? So uh, this is what it will look like in, uh, in uh, 2025 when the second crew has landed. So all the technology that we need, that we need to land humans on Mars, it exists. But then there's another very important question. <laughs> How much does it cost? <laughs> well, it will cost about 6 billion US dollars to put the first crew on Mars, and about 4 billion for every crew that we send after that. And that sounds like a lot of money, and actually it is a lot of money. But imagine what will happen when humans land on Mars, and even when they depart from Mars. And even now, as I just told you, when we tell people that we are going to Mars, the whole world is interested in something like this happening. And when humans depart to Mars and land on Mars, literally the whole world will watch. And this is an event like that is only comparable, I think even much bigger, but somewhat comparable to the Olympic Games. And now take a look at these figures. They're a bit small, but I'll explain them, which is the revenue of the International Olympic Committee. <laughs> and here you can see, uh, I think this is Atlanta and Beijing. And uh, in six weeks, so three weeks of uh, Winter Olympics and three weeks of Summer Olympics, the International Olympic Committee has revenues of almost $6 billion just from broadcasting rights, uh, sponsors, a little bit from ticketing, licensing. So, just because the whole world is watching, or a large fraction of the world is watching for six weeks to this event, it brings you revenues of almost $6 billion. And you can see in the right one, uh, where the London Olympics are included, uh, that it will be much bigger because just the, the value of, of the interest of the audience is increasing every uh, four years, as you can see in the bottom of this, uh, of this graph. So, our idea is that 
by making this a, a public event where we try to involve the whole world, uh, that we can finance this by having uh, sponsors uh, sponsor us and by having broadcasters pay for the, uh, for the rights to, to show what is happening on Mars. So we'll try to involve the whole world, not only because of, because of the financial aspects, but also because this should really be a project of the entire world, not by one nation of, or by, we believe, not by one nation or a space agency. Because this is a, the, exploration of, the exploration of humankind is really something that everybody is interested in. And this is why in our program, everybody in the world will be able to apply to become one of the astronauts. Of course, you have to be, uh, we, we're, we'll be looking for the best of the best. You have to be uh, smart, you have to be very healthy, <coughs> and uh, you, need to, you need to be literally the best of the best, but everybody will be able to apply. And this is, of course, something, uh, in, in ESA and NASA, these procedures are closed. We don't know, uh, we don't know who applied. We don't know why, the, uh, why Andre Kuipers finally went to, uh, to the International Space Station uh, last year. Uh, and we want to do the opposite, we want to make it completely open, because we believe that choosing, electing the first four people that go to Mars, the first ambassadors of Earth to another planet, that's one of the most, it's maybe the most important election ever, much more important than any presidential uh, campaign. So we'll ask the audience help after we have decided who are the best. Of the best, we'll ask the audience help to determine who can go. And so we'll be completely open, anyone can see why these people are, uh, are being selected. Then uh, they'll train for their mission for about uh, six years, uh, for about eight years, sorry, because, uh, and we'll train them in groups, and one of the parts of the training is that every year they have to be in a copy of the Mars base on Earth uh, to, uh, to really learn what it's like to be on Mars, having all the same uh, restrictions, and of course on Earth we can give them all kinds of uh, big problems to see, does the group stay a group, do they work well together? And finally, of course, when uh, when we actually depart to Mars and when humans land on Mars in the first months, uh, weeks and, sorry, weeks, months and maybe uh, years, the whole world will watch. And for a very, very long time, uh, a, a very large portion of the audience will be extremely interested to see how humans live on Mars, humans living on a new planet. So where are we now? We have a good technical design for what we are doing. Uh, all the components that we need, uh, they exist. We visited last year, uh, two years ago already, companies in the US, in Canada, and in Europe to talk about these components, major aerospace companies from all over the world, to ask them, can you build this for us? This is our timeline, this is our budget, is it realistic? And then we have, because suppliers do not always tell you the truth, we have ambassadors and advisors who help us to determine, are these, uh, are these the right companies? Is what they say, is that true? Uh, well, Gerard is one of our ambassadors, Gerard het Hoofd. Uh, on the right you can see Paul Romer, who's uh, helping us with the, uh, the media aspects of uh, what we're doing. Uh, then there's the Malaysian astronauts, who's one of, the, of our ambassadors. And uh, Pascal Ehrenfreund, who's from the NASA Astrobiology Institute, who's one of our advisors. And we have advisors from all over the world, from NASA, uh, people who help us to determine, uh, to, to find the weak spots in our plan and to improve them. Then, uh, what are we doing now? Well, we just uh, announced that we have the first two investors uh, in Mars One, and we're still looking for additional investment. Uh, we're about to award conceptual design studies to our uh, suppliers, uh, which means studies in which they uh, study the component which we want to buy from them in more detail, such that they can, get, that they can give us better estimates for the time and the budget. <coughs> and uh, soon after that, we want to launch the astronaut selection the process where everybody in the world will be able to apply to become one of the first four people going to Mars. Well, that's what I wanted to tell you, and I understand we do the questions uh, in the end, so thank you very much. <laughs>